I am thrilled to join you today at the CBC Toronto Broadcast Centre so we may immerse ourselves in arts and science, in sustainability and decarbonization, in connection, storytelling, and hope. Before we dive in, allow me to humbly acknowledge that the land we are on today is dish with one spoon territory, and the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And we are privileged to live, work, create content, and convene here. As allies in the ongoing battle against climate change, we stand united, determined to preserve and protect the land, to be stewards of its natural gifts, and to facilitate healing. This commitment echoes the enduring spirit of the Indigenous peoples who have safeguarded this land for countless generations. Today, we have an incredible lineup of guests and programming, and I extend my deep gratitude to SPF 23 lead partners, GreenSpark Group, CBC Radio Canada, Telefilm Canada, Real Green and Creative BC. Yes, let us thank them. Over to my right is the conference center, and this is where workshops will be held. Uh, you, need to, you needed to have signed up for workshops, um, and I believe they are mostly full. However, if you're interested, find something at the front desk, someone at the front desk, and we'll see what we can do about bringing you in. Um, those will be in the afternoon. Over to my left here, out the Wellington entrance, you will find the EV test rides, which will be scheduled from noon until 3 p.m. You also need to sign up and you need to sign a waiver, and you can do that at the driving force table over there with Ashton. <laughs> Please tag us at hashtag SPF23, hashtag Sustainable Production Forum. If you choose to share anything on social media, please share it with the world. Um, and tag us so we can share it as well. So we'll hear some key messages from our lead partners, and then we'll be joined by our distinguished speakers for opening remarks. That's Zena Harris, President, GreenSpark Group, Justin Cutler, Ontario Film Commissioner, Elisa Supa, Senior Advisor, Corporate Projects and Research, Telefilm Canada, and Barbara Williams, Executive Vice, Pre Vice President, CBC. Thank you. Let's watch. job at CBC Radio Canada to report on what we as Canadians care about. Politics, culture, sports, entertainment. But there's a bigger picture, something Canadians care about even more, the environment. It's what all the rest of it hinges on. We wouldn't be here without forests, wildlife, and oceans. Stories on the environment often have a way of making us feel powerless and small. Who are we against a hurricane? Who are we against a wildfire? Who are we against a changing climate? We are more powerful than it seems. So we're not just going to report on the environment. We're going to take action and help preserve all the things we care about. We've looked at how we can do better and set some goals for 2026. And that's just the beginning. 
Our ultimate goal is carbon neutral. As we move towards zero, we will report on our progress. Keeping you informed is our job, after all. Telefilm Canada champions independent storytelling in Canada that is sustainable and inclusive. We are inspired by Indigenous creators on the value of connecting story, land and language and of protecting our natural world. Our commitment is to work through the lens of sustainability in all we do. As an investor, a promoter, a financial administrator and as an employer. We will make positive change and reduce our impact by encouraging knowledge sharing, working in partnership with the industry to implement best practices, establishing science-based targets, and measuring our carbon footprint. With tools like our modernized budget template that now includes sustainability and EDI priorities and our sustainability plan template requirement, we strive to encourage sustainable productions. Together, we can build a sustainable and future-facing film industry. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Greetings from Ottawa, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person this year. Last year and the year before, I was impressed by the industry's efforts to go green. I know this year's forum is bigger and better than ever, both in Toronto and Vancouver. So first, let me thank Zena Harris and the rest of the organizers. And let me congratulate you for incorporating the forum as a nonprofit earlier this year. That tells me you plan to stick around. Je suis heureux de voir ce forum mettre l'accent sur la façon dont le secteur des arts et du divertissement peut réduire son empreinte carbone. Mais surtout, Vous insufflez des approches créatives pour sensibiliser les gens à respecter davantage la planète. Nous avons plus que jamais besoin de compteurs. Des gens créatifs, capables d'expliquer les défis mondiaux d'une manière qui nous motive et nous pousse à agir. C'est un concept maintenant reconnu et discuté à l'international. S'appuyer sur le milieu culturel pour communiquer l'action climatique à travers le cœur des gens. The Government of Canada is grateful to have such a compelling ally. It is becoming increasingly clear that we have an issue with climate literacy in Canada. An overwhelming majority of Canadians want climate action, but do not fully understand the broad social consensus that exists. Many, many Canadians are willing to act, but feel their fellow citizens are less inclined to do so. Why is that? Canadians are eager to better understand what actions they can take. Affordable, simple, everyday actions to fight climate change and they want to know that governments are holding major emitters to account. Your industry has an incredible important platform to help bridge the gap in climate literacy, to connect the scientific reality to human emotions, and to translate data and concepts into empathy and action. Climate impacts are influencing and will continue to influence the bread and butter struggles of Canadians. These are the stories you tell so well. So far, the government has committed more than $120 billion to address climate change and spur clean growth. We've established a plan to achieve our 2030 climate target and lay the foundation for achieving net zero by 2050. This plan is all about healthier communities, reliable and affordable energy, good jobs, and a strong economy. This includes putting in place the many milestones to achieve net zero, such as setting new emission standards for vehicles, capping emissions from the oil and gas sector, and reshaping our energy system. Since 2015, we've also invested more than $6.5 billion to help Canadians adapt to climate change at all levels. De plus, nous collaborons avec des partenaires pour garder le plastique dans l'économie et hors de l'environnement, et avec l'aide de plus de 100 organismes fédéraux pour adresser ce problème avec une approche pan-gouvernementale. To achieve our goals, it will take engagement by Canadians in all sectors and walks of life, including the world of arts and entertainment, which can benefit from electrification, from innovation technologies like hydrogen, and be first adopter of a circular economy. So again, let me thank the Forum for its leadership. May you continue to find creative ways to decarbonize and while telling us stories that inspire us and drive positive change in our society and the world. Thank you. 
Merci. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to SPF 23. Yay! We're here. <laughs> It's great to be back in Toronto to kick off the SPF this year. The enthusiasm and momentum uh, for sustainability last year, uh, it's, it's just contagious. We knew we had to come back to kick off. Um, so thank you for having us. Thank you for all being here. It's a testament to the folks in this room and many others who support and believe we can adapt as an industry to be future fit, modern, and resilient. Eight years ago, I founded a little conference with a big vision to bring together the film and TV industry and advance sustainability. And today, I am so proud to see how the SPF has evolved. This year, the SPF reached a big milestone. It is now housed at the Sustainable Entertainment Society a new nonprofit organization founded to serve the industry in the sustainable transition. Its whole purpose is to advance collective action. GreenSpark Group is a foundational partner, and we're proud of this evolution. But I dare say, our work has just begun. My team and I try to keep our finger on the pulse of our industry. You know, over the last few months, We've noticed a few words that I think kind of stand out. Passion, modernization, and accountability. There's clearly passion for the work to be a more sustainable industry. I'd say we wouldn't be here if folks didn't have passion for this work. And passion fuels the vision of what this industry will become, the modernization of our industry to work with and not against the climate. And there are many aspects of the industry that can contribute to the modernization, equipment, technical skills, data, policies. And in order to make good on these efforts, accountability is a must. Now there are many folks in this room that touch various aspects of the industry. Accountability plays a different role for each of us. We mustn't just talk about what we want to do to be sustainable. We must actively advance the big ideas, the collaboration, implement the practices, and track our progress to ensure we improve over time. I hope today inspires you and helps propel you in your work. I hope it helps you keep your passion alive, drives you to demonstrate how you are contributing to the modernization of our industry, and holding yourself, your team, your organization accountable. In my house, I have a newly minted teenage son, and I want him in 10 years to be able to choose to work in a thriving film and TV industry if he so desires. What we do now in the face of climate change will determine the options those seeking careers in the film and TV industry will have in the future. So let's make it good. Here's to passion. Here's to modernization and accountability. Here's to the amazing SPF team for seeing the vision. Here's to collective action, to all the partners who make that happen, and everyone here for leaning in working hard and showing up for sustainability in the film and TV industry. Thank you all. Have a great day. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sustainable Production Forum. Uh, my name is Justin Cutler, and I'm the Film Commissioner of Ontario at Ontario Creates. Uh, for those who don't know Ontario Creates, we are the agency that uh, provides um, growth opportunities for Ontario's cultural industries. I'm also the proud co-chair of the Ontario Green Screen Program, a position that I proudly share with Cynthia Lynch, Managing Director of Film Ontario, who's here in the audience this morning. Um, I have to say that I'm truly honored to be part of such an esteemed group, welcoming you all to the forum, uh, and also to see such a strong turnout. 
I mean, it's just incredible to see uh, such a motivated and talented group of people working towards a more sustainable future for our industry. So on behalf of uh, the Ontario um, uh, government and uh, the Ontario Green Screen Program, I'd like to thank the SPF team for their dedication to promoting sustainability on set and making Toronto a perennial stop for this forum. Uh, this event celebrates the wide range of both the institutional and the individual efforts that are being made towards sustainability, uh, both here in Ontario, across the country, and globally, and showing us that we're not alone in this movement towards a greener industry. Uh, Ontario Green Screen is proud to support SPF and its mission to accelerate sustainability. Uh, today's programming aligns squarely with Ontario Green, Green Screen's efforts to provide accessible education, resources, and tools to all film workers working across the province. Um, and particularly in a time where these actions are both necessary and urgent for the well-being of the industry, and more importantly, for our environment. Uh, if you're motivated to make change after the forum, I encourage you to visit ontariogreenscreen.ca where you can learn a lot more about what our coalition of 29 industry and government partners are putting forward to facilitate decarbonization and enable circularity on set, uh, building on initiatives that we've already launched, like our free sustainability and carbon calculation training that over 500 film workers have already taken advantage of, uh, easy to access electrical grid tie-in maps, material recovery through our relationship with partners and Project Green, and so many more resources and case studies. In fact, today, we're thrilled to launch Canada's first production waste audit produced through the generous support of Telefilm Canada. Um, it's going to provide guidance to industry and all levels of government to keep reusable materials on set and within a circular economy. So with that shameless plug for OGS, I hope you all have a fantastic day and enjoy the programming. And do visit us at the Ontario Green Screen Station here at the Expo. So enjoy. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour. I'm Elisa Supo with Telefilm Canada. I'm the Senior Advisor on Corporate Projects and Business Intelligence. And I'm excited to be here for the kickoff of 2023. I think this is a great place uh, for knowledge sharing and collaboration. Um, and I wanted to give a special thanks to Melanie and her team. They just do a great job um, every year. Yes, I agree. Uh, Telefilm's been a partner with the forum since, uh, sorry, with SPF since 2021. And I think what we most appreciate is that it's a place where we can really um, find new ways of connecting and working together. And it also puts a very sharp and clear lens on the challenges um, in sustainability along the entire production value chain. But it also provides us with an opportunity to connect and find solutions. Uh, Telefilm launched its eco action plan about 18 months ago, and I think there's just four sort of main themes that recur throughout uh, our reflection as we're working. One is to have and to be mindful of an Indigenous perspective on the issue. I think we learn from them in their holistic approach. It reminds us that land, language, and story are always beautifully intertwined. Also, the second thing is that we want our work to be thoughtful, informed, science-based, and effective. We want to provide pragmatic tools for our producers, who are our partners. The third thing is that we have to keep ourselves accountable, and that's in reporting. And I mean, there's different research efforts that we've done, and everything we do, we want to share out. And the last one is collaboration. I don't think we could do anything without partnerships. And uh, they inspire us. And I want to give a specific shout out to CBC for being great leaders. And I'm looking specifically at Lisa Clarkson, who challenges me all the time to think better. And also, I mean, our provincial partners, I would say Ontario Green Screen and Real Green, uh, they were the first out of the gate on this priority. So I want to thank them. Um, there's just a couple of tools I want to highlight that Telefilm is now implementing. One is, I think it was mentioned in our promo reel, the updated uh, production budget. So now there's line items that address the key challenges that producers are facing in terms of sustainability costs, as well as EDI sensitive uh, related items. And the second is now a requirement for a sustainability plan. So if you are successful in receiving funding, the, a, a deliverable now will be that you must submit a sustainability plan. 
And people ask me, why the plan? Uh, what we've heard from really effective and impactful producers is that you must plan, and plan early. Um, so we expect to see those plans at least three to four weeks before pre-production. Um, we will be actually having a session on those two tools so at 2 o'clock, so maybe I'll see some of you there. Um, I just want to close by saying thank you, and I hope that you'll uh, enjoy the forum as I, I know I will. So thank you very much. It's amazing to see such a turnout here this morning. I'm so impressed. It's so great all of you are here. We have to do this. Yes. yes. And this is the eighth annual, which is hugely impressive and shows momentum and commitment and drive and change and all those good things. But guys, we have to do this. Our industry is bad. But the good news in that is that if we actually make the change we're talking about, if we really lean in, if we take advantage of all those tools that Telefilm's putting in front of us, if we listen to all of the experts that now have so much information, the good news is we can really make a difference. And the opportunity is sitting right there in front of us. I'm clearly a little passionate about this work. And I'm trying in my own life to do the little things that I can do. I know one by one we're all trying to do the little things we can do, but it is the collective that's really going to make a difference. And so we need, and some of you have touched on this, we need to work with everybody who's out there that's sort of offering a helping hand. We need to work with the provincial climate action policies and the federal climate action policies. We need to lean into those, take advantage of them, and use them to make the change that we want. Because that opportunity is sitting right there. People have ideas, they have information, they have money, and we need to get at it to make the difference that we really want to make. And you know, we're in the content business here at CBC, and content has such an important role to play. We can't underestimate the importance of climate storytelling to help bridge that gap between the scientific facts and the human emotion that we do so well on the screen. It's all about taking advantage of each narrative to see what you can do to translate the data and the concepts into empathy and action. Because each program, scripted, unscripted, documentary, children's shows, uh, news reports, all of it has an opportunity to infuse climate action into the storytelling. We do a lot of it, I think, pretty well here at CBC. I'm pretty proud of a whole bunch of the programs that we do. From CBC's What on Earth on Radio 1, if you haven't listened to it, Laura Lynch is amazing our changing climate, the nature of things, and the list goes on and on and on. And we have a dedicated unit in our news team. Like, we're working at this, but everybody needs to work at this. No one of us is going to be able to do this alone. You know, the truth is our industry continues to grow. In fact, last year was a record year. Total production volume leapt by an unprecedented amount reaching an all-time high of $11.6 billion. That's a lot of economic activity that we put into the country, which is fantastic. But, and anyone who knows me well knows I don't use that word very often, but the only real win to all that unprecedented growth is if we do it sustainably. So as I said last year at this event, everything we do for climate change is unquestionably the most important transformation each of us can make in our personal and professional lives. And if you invite me back again next year, I'll say it all over again. Because each of these words becomes more and more critical with each passing day. We are delighted to have you here at the CBC today and play a role in supporting this important conference. You have many, many experts and workshops and conversations and activities ahead of you today. And I hope 
When you leave at the end of the day, you'll be that much more inspired to take that step into the next piece of change that has to happen. And we're here to help motivate and do our bit. So thank you for being here. And please, please go forth boldly into this space that has to change and has to change soon. So thanks very much. Have an amazing day. I'm going to get out of the way and let you get going at it. Thank you. Thank you, Zena, Justin, Elisa, and Barbara for those uplifting and inspiring messages. I wrote this before, but I knew it was for sure. So we're honored to be joined today by David Miller, former mayor of Toronto and managing director of the C40 Centre for City Climate Policy and Economy to deliver this year's keynote address. Let us hear from him on the transformative potential of local leadership in achieving global climate solutions. Welcome, David. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Melanie, for that gracious introduction, and everyone, both for your warm welcome and more importantly for what you're doing every day to try to transform this incredibly important uh, industry in Canada and certainly in Toronto uh, and Vancouver. Your industry matters, and I've always loved the film and television industry because it's the place where Canadians can tell their stories to each other. And yeah, have some few American things too, but it's so important in a little country like ours to have a place where we share our stories and our history and can speak to each other. And uh, for you to have decided collectively that sustainability matters and make the efforts you are uh, to ensure that the entire industry can actually live in harmony with our planet is inspiring and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, I am going to speak about uh, cities and climate change mostly because that's what I know about and the work I do but also because I think there's some really important lessons from local leadership on climate that matter to this industry. And as you'll hear in my remarks, uh, the best cities have a climate plan that they're acting on. And if you want to know more, you can read my book. But um, the best cities have a climate plan they're acting on. The best cities are liberally stealing ideas from each other. And those climate plans are creating action in the areas of waste, of how we generate our electricity, of transportation, and of how we heat cool and use our buildings. And all of those areas are directly applicable to what you do. Because in your productions, you generate electricity, you use transportation, you make buildings, at least fake ones. You're in buildings and you generate huge amounts of waste. So there is a massive opportunity to learn lessons from what's been happening globally in cities. And I, you know, the context of this is we are in the climate emergency. It's not something that, you know, is going to come in 2050. It's now. These are some headlines from last year. I could have put up the wildfires this year. The Canadian wildfires were so bad that there was a health emergency in New York City, in Washington, D.C., in Philadelphia from smoke from thousands of kilometers away. And those wildfires are very connected with climate change because the changing weather patterns <coughs> have had a huge impact on drying out the forests and also on the spread of insects beyond their normal range. So we are seeing climate change today. And it's an emergency, it's a crisis, and if you think about Lytton, British Columbia, a small indigenous community, I'm sure you all know that two years ago it burnt down in 21 minutes, the entire town. You might not know that three months later it was flooded. Both of those events were related to climate change. And then this year was threatened again by wildfires and had more burning. That's just one small place in, in British Columbia. But indicative 
of what's happening. And in that context, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to respect the science which says we need to act today. In fact, what the science and the latest UN reports say, first of all, is that we need to keep overall average temperature rise to 1.5 degrees or less. We're somewhere around 1.2 now. So if we keep burning fossil fuels at the rate we are today, we will probably surpass that 1.5 degree threshold in the next five or six years. So we need to do everything we can today to minimize the use of fossil fuels. It's really, uh, really critical. And what science says is that we have to half, it's a bit hard to see on this chart, but these are the various pathways globally. We have to basically half emissions. The UN Secretary General says 40 by 45 percent by 2030. So in seven years, we have to cut the amount of emissions in the world in half. That means that there's no room at the moment for waiting for new technologies to be invented or hypothetical ideas that haven't been proven at scale yet, like carbon capture and storage. You'll see a lot about this in the newspaper. Uh, but it hasn't been proven at scale. We can't wait. We have to do everything that is possible to do today and do it now and take the best ideas from somewhere and do them all at once if we're going to meet that target. <clears throat> and it's really touch and go. And if we don't do it, we're going to see many more Littons, many more wildfires. The flooding we've seen in Pakistan, Jakarta a couple of years ago got no attention in the news because of the Australian wildfires, but it had biblical levels of floods. And the uh, Prime Minister of Indonesia has said they need to move their capital, which is Jakarta, because of the risks from climate change related flooding. 12 million people live there. How do you move them? Where do they go? These are the things that are happening in the world. They haven't even spoken to uh, desertification in Africa, extreme heat events. It's serious, it's now, it's today, and we have to act. These pathways basically show what's going on in the world. And if you look at the blue one, current policies, that's basically where the world is at. And three degrees would be a disaster. That's when things like uh, the uh, currents that protect England and the United Kingdom and keep them warm in winter reverse, and you end up with uh, the United Kingdom becoming a climate like Edmonton's, for example, very cold in the winter, complete change. The pledges are what national governments have agreed to, woefully insufficient, including ours. You know, in Canada, we often talk a good game, but we're not acting to the level that's needed. What we need is the pathway at the bottom, and there are very few governments committed to that pathway, except for cities. And that's why cities matter, because local leadership can produce real change. They also matter because until about 2008 or 2009, the world since the first human settlements was predominantly rural. In about 2008, 2009, because of the growth of megacities in China and India and elsewhere, the world for the very first time became a majority urban world. So most people live in cities. It's also the place, places with most of the greenhouse gas emissions and most of the economies. So our urban areas are where, by and large, the problem of climate change is occurring. And therefore, it's also the place where we should look to solutions. And the good news is that mayors are showing leadership that national governments aren't. I work for C40 Cities, which is a coalition of 100 of the world's largest cities, cities like Beijing, um, Cape Town, Jakarta, uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, Toronto, uh, which was a founding member, uh, London, Paris. And the mayors have agreed, in order to be a member of this organization, you must have a climate plan that does your share of holding overall average temperature hike to 1.5 degrees, and you must be implementing it. And if you don't, you're very politely asked to leave. And cities have been asked to leave because they're not achieving their goals. And 75% of these cities and these mayors represented in this slide 
uh, have climate plans that are being implemented at a pace much faster than their national governments. And how do they do it? Well, they create a plan. And of that 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions that occurs in cities, most of them occur in transportation, buildings, how we manage our waste, and how we generate our electricity. So each of these climate plans exists for the urban region, not just for the city government's activities, and addresses within that urban area uh, those sectors of transportation, waste, buildings, and how we generate our electricity. So what's happening? Well, these large cities have led a bigger global movement of smaller cities and towns. So two years ago in Glasgow at COP26, COP is the annual UN conference, as I'm sure everybody here knows, uh, a movement for cities race to zero was created. Over a thousand cities and towns, small and large globally, are now committed to those same targets of having, doing their fair share of having by 2030 on a path to net zero by 2050. There's been investment. On the transportation sector, the most important thing in some ways is building a city where you actually don't have to drive. A city that's walkable, where you can ride your bike, uh, <clears throat> where you can live in a neighborhood and have most of your daily needs met in that neighborhood, including working. But we do need to have clean transportation, including the electrification. In South America, there's a big movement to electrify their bus fleets, but there was no money. And often in environmental causes, there's a transition cost, even though it's much cheaper to do the right thing once you start doing it. And so <clears throat> uh, through C40's work with some partners, we've created a huge fund of private investment to help city governments in Latin America acquire electric buses and change their bus fleets from diesel to electric. Denmark is leading by taking the ideas from C40 um, uh, including our, our planning program, which is called Deadline 2020, because that was the original deadline to have a plan. And um, I've taken the, the example of Copenhagen, which is a C40 member, and there are now 97 Danish cities with climate plans that commit to 1.5 degrees, having by 2030, and actions in the area I spoke about, cities large and small. And in your industry, which is very local and often neighborhood-based uh, when you're filming, I think this is a really important precedent, that the ideas from the biggest places can be made real on the, uh, on the streets of small towns as well. And Deadline 2020 is our plan, as I, as I mentioned, and all of the C40 cities uh, have a Deadline 2020 compliant plan today and are implementing it. Uh, or were invited to leave. So how are they doing that? Well, what the large cities do is work with each other, listen, and shamelessly steal ideas. So Oslo, Norway, has focused on construction. Yeah, how do we actually build buildings, not just buildings that are zero emission, but how do we build buildings that uh, when we build them, the construction process is zero emission as well. And in most cities in the world, how you build and how you heat and cool your buildings is the single biggest source of greenhouse gases. And it's not very exciting. You know, if you're campaigning to be mayor, you can campaign on, I'm gonna build light rail transit all over Scarborough. Or somebody else might campaign on, I'm gonna build a one-stop subway in Scarborough and cancel the light rail transit. But, <laughs> I digress. Um, it's, it's hard to campaign saying we're going to make buildings energy efficient because it's not sexy. Maybe your industry can tell the story right, but it matters enormously, enormously from a global perspective. Um, so there's work being done there. And what the cities are doing is partnering with each other to learn from and steal these ideas. So you can see the list of cities that's working on the zero emission construction uh, globally. Vancouver is the leader in the world on requiring new buildings to be built to the highest environmental standards. It's extraordinary what they've done. It's real leadership, and I'm very proud to tell that story as a Canadian when I speak in other countries. And there's some interesting, creative, fun things being done. That's a building in Milan. Uh, the architect called it a vertical forest. 
I don't really know if it helps minimize emissions, but it sure looks beautiful and it's lots of fun and the air around it's going to be very, very clean. So what else is happening? People are seriously addressing transportation issues. Mayor Sadiq Khan of London, who's our chair, has uh, imposed essentially tolls, the ultra low emissions zone, and he's spoken to people in London about the connection between driving diesel and gasoline powered cars and asthma in children. And their entire campaign has not been about the climate benefits of this policy, which makes it very difficult to drive, expensive to drive into London with a polluting vehicle. It's about the health benefits. And it's been a highly successful campaign, even though there's been some political difficulties. And you can imagine the online discussions about, uh, about this in some forum. Because he has very correctly, properly, and scientifically connected a solution with a real problem. And the rates of asthma amongst children in London are extraordinary. It's a tragedy. And to me, it illustrates another point. When we do the right thing about climate change, we're actually doing the right thing for uh, ourselves as human beings, for our planet, and for our economy. And I'm, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead a couple of things here. One of the big movements amongst cities is divesting from fossil fuels, uh, including cities' pension funds. You know, the New York City employees pension fund is massive, and it's divesting from fossil fuel investments. Why? Because it's immoral and wrong to give new capital to fossil fuel companies at a time. Uh, thank you. But it is immoral and wrong to give new capital to fossil fuel companies at a time the planet is on fire. But also, it's a bad investment. So they're trying to steer their pension funds to move to investments in green energy, solar, uh, energy retrofits, and so forth. And one of the interesting things about this leadership for me is that the divestment movement was creating huge pressure on many institutions, like our universities, and nobody moved until New York City and London, the financial capitals of the Western world, their city governments divested. And then we saw all sorts of others get on the train. And that, to me, is why leadership matters in that example from cities. And the final point I want to make is that all of these cities' climate plans address another really important issue, which is social justice and inclusion and jobs. You know, a mayor is not elected solely to do his or her part to address climate change. A mayor is elected to build a great city for all of its residents. And that means building a city where everyone is welcome. You know, in Toronto's case, for example, one of the reasons we were building a transit network all over this city uh, was not just because it was the right thing to do for the environment, not just to allow for this city to be a place where people could live in every neighborhood without having to own a car, but it was because in lower income neighborhoods in Toronto, people take transit and they're stuck on the bus. And low income people who are working two or three part-time jobs to put food on the table deserve the same access to rapid transit that Rosedale has. It even has its own subway stop. Rosedale. And yet, Northwest Etobicoke and Northeast Scarborough have nothing. And all of the best city-based climate plans address that issue. How do we include people from economically marginalized communities, and how do we ensure that this work on climate produces jobs that they can access? And why is that relevant to your industry? Well, first of all, film and television is a huge job creator. Secondly, it's very local, often very local industry. And thirdly, there is the potential, if we have climate plans with suitable goals and actually implement them, to do our part as an industry and be part of this significant global trend. And we really have to. Because the, the Littons are going to be more and more and more unless we act. There will be more and more wildfires. There will be massive flooding. And there will be millions, if not hundreds of millions, of climate migrants moving all over the world. 
Our political and cultural systems, our economic systems aren't set up to handle this, let alone nature, which of course nature will adapt, but maybe not in the world in which we, in which we wish to live. And I was asked when I was chatting and having a coffee, a friend said, what's your goal be? How do we measure things on our production? I think the goal should be pretty simple. We should be targeting net zero productions. We shouldn't be producing waste, it should be reused. Food waste should be composted. We should have electric vehicles. And we should generate clean, elect uh, clean electricity. This is all possible. There's clean electricity right there. It's all possible today. And what inspires me working with this wonderful coalition of mayors globally is not only is it possible, but it's happening. And I know everybody in this room wouldn't be here unless you care. So I'm asking you to speak to your colleagues and your peers and just say, we will have a simple goal. We're going to be a zero-based production, and we're going to do it by addressing waste and having a goal of zero waste. We're going to do it by addressing our emissions from transportation. We're going to do it by addressing the emissions from the buildings we work in. Why aren't they clean if they're not? Why aren't they zero emission? And we're going to do it by generating clean electricity on site when we need a generator. We can actually do this, and we can be part of something that matters, not just here in Toronto, not just in Vancouver, not just across Canada where we have locations. It matters globally. We're a small country, but we can be a leader. And I think as we saw from the sponsors when they spoke, we have leadership in this industry. In fact, all of you are the leaders. And I wish you success in ensuring that your leadership in wherever you work uh, produces real outcomes and actions today because that's what we need. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and I uh, know you'll enjoy the events today, but more importantly, take your message out and go make change. Thank you.